Good evening, guys. We stand together tonight. And pray for us. Jesus, we love you, and we know that you're with us tonight. this week means, what this weekend means for all believers around the world. And we celebrate, we remember, we cherish and we hold on to your story, to your sacrifice, to your love for us. We celebrate the cross. celebrate all the work that you did on our behalf. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate you, Jesus. We love you. In the darkness we were weak without hope and without light to free you came right there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. So praise the Father. So praise the Father. Praise the
come and I confess and bowing here I find my rest cause without you I fall apart and you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I Runs deep. The sin runs deep. Your grace is more. The grace is found. Is where you are. Where you are. The Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I comes my way when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay sing Lord I need you so Lord I need you oh communion cups over there. Did you guys get one of those when you came in? Okay. We're going to use those in a little bit. And uh, they wanted me, to me, wanted me to explain to them what those were. They thought they were snacks. <laughs> I assured them they would have snacks uh, down with the kids at the playground, probably. But uh, <laughs> this last week, we were trying to explain to our kids more about Easter and Good Friday and Holy Week and what it means and why we celebrate. And 
you know, they've been in church their whole lives, so they sort of understand already. In fact, last Sunday, um, this shows you how awesome our kids' ministry is. Last Sunday, we get in the car, and my youngest, Millie, goes, Well, Dad, I got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> And I said, okay, well, let's start with the bad news. She goes, the bad news is, um, I learned in Sunday school today that I have to love Jesus more than you and Mom. <laughs> and then she goes, but the good news is, I still can love you guys too. <laughs> so, we had to tell her this week, she would just, the first thing out of her mouth in the morning was like, I don't love you as much as Jesus. <laughs> Okay, you don't have to tell us every day. <laughs> you know. This is the girl that couldn't talk yeah. super well a year ago. <laughs> now we can't get her to stop. But um, so then a couple nights ago, we were at the dinner table and, and we were talking to Grace, and she's our oldest, and we were trying to explain to her, and she just wasn't quite catching it. And I said, Well, think of it this way: if you know, Daddy loves you so much, and if you were in danger, if, let's say you walked out in the street and a car was coming. I would jump in front of that car to save your life. I would give my life for yours. And it absolutely freaked her out and scared her. And she became hysterical. And I was like, oh my goodness. So we spent the next two or three hours just talking through that and processing through that. And what I learned is my youngest learned in Sunday school, they taught her about the resurrection and Jesus going to the cross and she got it. She understood and then we told our oldest about it, and we explained it to her, and, and it terrified her, but she got it. She understood. And it, it made me think about how many times uh, do us adults, uh, we sort of lose the authenticity and the realness of Easter and of the cross. And it almost falls back to just a Bible story that we talk about every year and we celebrate. We know that it's true, and there are times when it feels more real. But I want to get it, like my girls get it. We watched our kids shocked at the sacrifice, just truly horrified at by, you know, when we were explaining what, what Jesus went through and that it wasn't an easy death. He didn't just say, oh, I'll, I'll take your punishment. It's okay, I'll take your consequence. We tried to explain what that consequence looked like. And Jonathan and I talked later about how we sort of you know, as, as you celebrate Easter and you get older, sometimes you forget the shock. We should still be shocked at what he went through. We should be shocked like those kids hearing it the first time. And so it was good for us to go through that with the girls and remember that. Yep. So, um, this is a song about that. How wide is your love that you would stretch your arms and go around the world and why for me will the Savior's cry be heard I don't know why you went where I was meant to go I don't know why Oh. 
Once my crown pierced your hands and your brow. Those were my thorns, those were my scorns, those were my tears that fell down. And just as you said it would be, you did it all for me. And after you counted the cause, you took my shame, my blame, my cross. Those were my nails, that was my crown It pierced your hands and your brow Those were my thorns, those were my scorns Those were my tears that fell down And just as you said it would be You did it all To my shame, my blame, my cross. Jesus, we love you tonight. We are thankful, Lord. We worship you tonight, Jesus. It's just the fav most favorite service of the year for me. I just love it. It's uh, healthy to be meditative and reflective. Uh, I do pray as I share tonight that God will help you fall more in love with Jesus. I think just what they have said is so true. He gave so much for us, and how can we ever, ever understand it all? So, One of the privileges I have as a pastor is to go and visit people in the hospital when they are sick and Sometimes when they are close to dying, and I go, of course, to encourage them, to build them up, and I'm just always amazed at how many times they encourage me, and they build me up instead of me building them up. And I reflect on that, and I understand that one of the dynamics that happens on these kinds of visits is that we stop talking about sports and money and politics and weather we start talking about deeper issues of life and death. We talk about family. We talk about love. We talk about the impact that others have had in my life and that this person who is sick has had in our life. We talk about what's going to happen in the long run. We talk about what God's plans are and the fact that we really know and believe that God has a plan and he's going to work it out. And as we talk, the more we talk, the more I realize that, wow, we're just kind of talking about the values that really happen in life. And that happens because we're looking at the possibility of death. And I think that's a good thing to do. Tonight, we're going to kind of look at Jesus, at what he was thinking on the cross. We're going to look at the seven last words of Christ, really seven last phrases of Christ. And it really reveals so much about our Lord, about what he was thinking, even in this horrible, horrible moment, how he was thinking about others and what others really could do and benefit from what he was doing on the cross. We're going to see that he emphasizes three different truths that make a difference. He's going to talk about how he is totally a man. He is total deity. And he is our Savior. Simple? But just imagine, he is saying and thinking all of this on the cross. He affirms that in his last moments. 
It's kind of interesting to me that today we as a culture end up questioning the deity of Christ the most. We can't imagine that he was really God. He was just a good prophet, a man, but not really God. Well, in the first century, the real question they had was, is Jesus, he's just a, he, he's just a man. Is he really a man? He, he's done so many miracles. How can you say he's just a man? So the first thing I want to talk about here is that Jesus claims that he is human with his first words that I want to look at, where he says, I am thirsty. It's John 19, and verse 28. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there and read along with me. Later, knowing that everything had been finished, I think that's a very interesting phrase. It's, in his mind, this is already done. And so that scripture would be filled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Uh, yeah, he's thirsty. It makes sense. He's had a rough day. He's carried a cross. He's hung on the cross for six hours. He's had people throwing stones at him and arguing with him, and he, he's worn out. His, his legs are cramping. His stomach, the muscles are kind of knotting up. He, he's kind of like thirsty and ravaging with thirst. And he's kind of wondering, how in the world am I going to get through this day, one person described the crucifixion this way, if you want to listen and maybe get a new picture. With the severe loss of blood from the scourging and crucifixion, Jesus would have become dehydrated, and his body would have less blood to carry oxygen. Therefore, his heart would beat faster as it attempted to compensate, and his need for oxygen would increase greatly. The loss of blood caused an extreme thirst as the body craves water, to restore the lost blood. I don't know what I would have done in a situation like that, but I, I'm amazed that he didn't call 10,000 angels and say, over with this. That's enough. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. I refuse to do what you're saying here. But he was dedicated to experiencing the pain and suffering that we experience. Earlier, they had offered him some kind of wine, but it was kind of to be a sedative, to kind of stop the pain. He refused it then because he was committed to experiencing the pain and being able to sympathize with the pain that we go through. He was a real man. The second saying that he made on the cross was, Dear woman, here is your son. If you are going to look in John chapter 19 and verse 26, you can see the context for this. When Jesus saw his mother, he's on the cross. His mother's down low. There's a few women there and John the apostle. When Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved, that's most people believe, apostle John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, uh, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Wow, can you imagine watching your son be treated like this? When you know he's innocent, he's being mocked and scorned and porking up. And here, in the midst of that, he's thinking about mom. <laughs> And he says, Mom, I want John to take care of you here. He's young, he's sensitive, he's, he's caring, he will provide for you. It's, it's kind of interesting to ask where was Joseph at a time like this because he's not mentioned and because Jesus gives his mother to John, most think he was either dead or he was out of the picture some way. It would have been disrespectful for him to give his wife to somebody else if he was really right there and stuff. But the point is, here's a single woman with all the cares and burdens of life, and she's seen her son be put through all these horrible things, and now she sees his love. He's a human. He's real. He's concerned. He's caring about her. The third kind of saying on the cross that shows that he was completely human is, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. 
Now think about what he could have said. <laughs> he could have said, God, pour out wrath on these people, paralyze them, destroy them, hurt them like they're trying to hurt me. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't get it. They don't understand what's going on here. And actually the tense of the verbs here it means he kept saying, he kept praying, he kept praying, he kept praying. Do you understand what he's doing here? He's becoming an advocate. He's becoming a lawyer suggesting to God why he ought to be giving grace to these people. They're being very unjust, but he's trying to say, be lenient on them, God. Be fair. Luke 23 and verse 34, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not smart about everything. They don't understand that I'm God. They don't understand the prophecies. Uh, their religious leaders have not really told them the truth. It's kind of misled them about who I really am. And we can argue. I mean, they knew some of what they were doing, but they didn't understand the depth of how this is going to affect all of eternity in what they were doing. And one thing that's kind of interesting, in the Old Testament, there is a group of laws that if you do something intentionally, the consequence is worse than if you do it unintentionally. Did you know that? I think that's kind of interesting in the way that God works. And I think what he's saying here is, God, they're not intentional about this, although it looks like they kind of knew it. Interesting verse in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, you might want to jot down the reference. It says, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Let me say it again. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. None of the rulers of this age got it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They don't understand, Jesus is saying. Be nice to them. Be forgiving do your grace. Here he is being crucified. And he's thinking about the grace of God in their life. This is one of my favorite verses because it was a verse that after years and years of struggling with being upset that my father left when I was 11 years old and never kind of ever getting over it, it was that verse that the Holy Spirit laid on my heart one day and said, he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't understand it. And he was confused. And I've been able to talk to him before he passed away and found out that was the case. He, he was really confused. He didn't know what the best thing to do was. He thought it was better for us if he would just leave. And I was able to forgive him on a new level. I mean, forgiveness, I think, is over and over and over and over again. But it was a verse that God used in my life in a great way. But the point here is Jesus is totally human. He's divine, of course, too. But he was willing to experience all the pain, the suffering that we experience because he wants to be able to identify with us. Second thing we see here with the seven last sayings of Jesus is that he declares and affirms that he is Savior. And aren't we glad <laughs> that he is our Savior? Nobody else could have done what he did. Nobody else was qualified to pay the penalty for our sins. And if he had chosen not to do it, I guess God would have had another way, but, but we are indebted to him for sure. One of his sayings on the cross from Matthew 27 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 45. If you have your Bibles, I'll read it. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Can you imagine? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, love you which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was, this was radical. They, they, they had been, Father and Son and the Holy Spirit were totally intimately connected for centuries and centuries from all eternity. And now suddenly there's a break. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I... I don't really see him as being defiant at this point or not trusting God. I, he, he's still saying, you're my God. I'm not giving up on that. I just don't understand what's going on here. It's a legitimate question. Isn't it? You had that question before. God, what, what's going on? 
in this situation. And Jesus is simply expressing the agony of being separated from the Father and saying, God, why have you departed from me? Help me understand this. This is a shock to my system. It doesn't make sense to me that I'm over here and you're over there and you've rejected me. It makes me kind of think, and I want you to meditate a little bit if you want to understand the depth of this, what it would have been like to be a part of the Trinity. I mean, wouldn't you be love to be in a small group with the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Actually, you can be, huh? But, but just think about that. They, they were always doing what was loving for the other person. They didn't have their own agenda. They didn't manipulate each other, didn't use each other. They were always concerned about what was best for the other person. And now suddenly, they've been separated. You've probably had an experience like that where there's somebody that you love dearly and you thought the relationship was going to go on forever and one day it comes in and crash, they betray you, they leave you, they turn their back on you, they do the opposite of what you really thought was loving. And you, you're kind of confused. And here, Jesus is kind of confused, I think. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the parts of being in the Trinity that I think is fascinating to think about is they didn't need any rules as to how they're going to act. They were totally loving. They were always going to do what was best for the other person all the time. No jealousy, no disappointment. Just totally for each other all the time. Uh, and there was no, a lot of things, I wrote down some things here, there was no forgetting the, or what was going on, manipulating, there was no flaking out, there was no failing to follow through, no arguments, no tension, no insults, no insensitivities. It was a dream relationship. And now it's been ripped out of Jesus' hands. It, it just went really, really deep, I think. He's gone from this intimate relationship with God to this wrath and judgment on his life. 27 and verse 46, the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we kind of prepare for communion tonight, I, I want us to kind of reflect on the total wrath of God being poured out on Jesus. He was cursed. He was abandoned. He was deserted. He was punished. He'd already been rejected by his own family and by his hometown Judas had rejected him. Now some of the disciples are trying to figure out what's going on. And now God has hit his face. And the masses are mocking him and ridiculing him and laughing and scoring at him. And he did it for us as the song. I love that song. That was great. All for us. Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Jesus even cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane. I was trying to think about how this would have felt. I, this is so far from what God experienced, but it's almost as if when I was a teenager, I did something wrong with 10 of my other buddies. And when I went home, my dad decided, well, back in our day, we had spanking. Did any of you grow up with spanking? Well, we had spanking. We had a little tree out there. We went through one tree. We had to go through another tree. We, did, we had four boys, so we kept going through trees and stuff. But but there was no holding back, you know, you just spanked. And so what if I had to be spanked for all 10 boys? I'd say, that's not fair. Jesus did it for the whole world. <laughs> he took on our wrath. It was the greatest display of injustice. And of justice at the same time. Think about that again. It was the greatest display of injustice. And justice. Injustice because Jesus was totally innocent. Justice because he paid the penalty for all the sins. I want you to close your eyes for a second and just kind of meditate on this as we prepare for communion. Think about the fact that Jesus was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Isn't that something? He entered into darkness so that we could walk in light. He died so that we live. He experienced isolation so that we'd never have to be alone. He suffered hell on earth so we could enjoy heaven. He drank the cup of wrath so that we could drink the cup of joy. He was cursed so we could be blessed. He lost all beauty so that we could have the beauty that lasts. And he was stripped of honor. 
so that we would have honor for all of eternity. You can look back up here. Isn't that amazing? Think about that as you hold the cup. I kind of think it's kind of neat that you have the cups now so that you're able to kind of be meditating on what all God did. The fifth saying of Christ, it is finished. John 19 and verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I don't know how you picture that. I, I don't see that as a, a moaning defeat. I see that as a shout of triumphant joy. I have finished doing what God asked me to do. John 17 and verse 4, Jesus said, I have finished the work you gave me to do. He hadn't saved everybody. And healed everybody, but he had provided salvation for everyone. He had finished. He had, I don't know, maybe it's like you finish a marathon. It's like, wow, this is celebrating. He said, it is absolutely finished and completed. The term was a merchant term, which meant the debt is paid. To Telestai, a, a, a priest, when he was sacrificing the animals, would get an unblemished lamb, and he would sacrifice, and he would... Say, it is finished. It is paid for. The sin has been paid for. That's what when you hold this cup in your hand, I think it's good to, to think about some of the sins in your life that have been paid for and really believe that that greed, that envy has been paid for. Uh, that bad motive, that lustful thought that you wish didn't happen or that time you were judging and criticizing. I kind of encourage myself and I encourage you to do it periodically. Write down some of your sins and then put this big X on it. Paid for by Christ. It is finished. All these sins have been paid for. What was finished? The Old Testament prophecies were totally fulfilled. The Old Covenant law was finished as a means of getting salvation. Satan was finished as one with power, and all of our sins had been paid for forever and ever and ever. And we kind of think, well, you know, I need to do a little something to kind of pay for sin myself. I've got to do it. I, to me, that's kind of like somebody giving you a million-dollar house, and every month you take them $10 to kind of make up for what they did for you. We can't get close. We don't need to even try that. That's the good news, isn't it? We're not saved by our works. It is is finished. I'm excited and thankful as you hold this cup. Jesus is human. Jesus is Savior. Number three, Jesus is absolute deity. He is absolutely God. Sixth saying is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23 and verse 44 is the context. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until th three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining. Can you just even imagine what that was like? And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, which you want to note, never in the Old Testament is God called Father. <laughs> this was a, a, a term of intimacy. And Jesus says, I have this intimate relationship with you. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. He's actually quoting here Psalm 31. This is interesting because he's quoting Psalm 31, which says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. But when the Jews memorized verses, they would just say part of it, implying they knew the whole thing. And the next part of the verse says this. I'll read the first part. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me. O Lord God of truth. They say that parents would often have kids memorize this verse and say it before they went to sleep. Into God's hands I'm committing my spirit. But I don't know if Mary said this to Jesus, but he knew it. The next part of it says redemption is right around the corner. God knows how to take whatever horrible thing and redeem it, turn it around, make it something good. It looks like, as we look at all this, that Satan is in control, the enemy is in control. He says, no, I'm in the hand of God. My times are in your hands, Psalm 31, and verse 15 goes on to say. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Jesus voluntarily died. 
The lambs that were slain, slain weren't voluntary. They had to be forced. But, but Jesus purposely gave up his heart. John 10 and verse 17 says, The reason my father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. Jesus chose to pay the penalty for us. He had other options. He had power. He had the angels. He had whatever, but he didn't back up. The final of the seven sayings is, remember, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's a story of, as you well know, most of you, the two thieves that are on either side of Jesus. And as they are being crucified, their views of Jesus are totally opposite. One is very rebellious and is insulting Jesus, escorting him. The other is kind of open to what Jesus is doing here. Verse 39 of Luke 23 says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and, you, and us. He, he was the rebellious one. This was a cross of rebellion. He was hardened by sin and insulting. And he was physically close to Jesus, but a long ways away spiritually. I thought you were Jesus. I thought you were God. Do some miracles for yourself. But the other thief, if you remember, verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Pretty grave. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we are getting, what we are, we, our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. L listen to this testimony he gives about Jesus and about himself. He says, we deserve punishment. Jesus is innocent. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It's kind of interesting to me. They both heard the same words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They heard the words of the people reading the words on the cross that Jesus is king. But one responded in humility and one was in arrogant pride, refused to do it. I love verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? <laughs> and he kind of ends up witnessing to the other thief. Don't you fear God? Don't you know that he is the king of a kingdom? Verse 42, then he thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's amazing that this thief understood Jesus was the king of a kingdom. And he actually says, remember me. He asked for Jesus to take care of him. I hope that's what each of us will do as we hold the cup in our hands, that we will yield ourselves, be honest about our sins, and recognize they've all been paid for, but have that humility to say, God, I need you to help come and pay for my sins even more and give me the forgiveness. I'm so grateful for what you've been able to do for me. So, as you hold the cup, he affirms he's human. Thank you, Jesus. He affirms that he is the Savior. We couldn't do without it. He affirms his absolute deity. Let's pray together. God, as we prepare our hearts for communion here, we are overwhelmed with your great love, with your great commitment, with your sacrifice. I pray as we share tonight that indeed uh, there'll be a sense of your presence that will go way beyond what is normal. You have done so many miracles. Please do another miracle tonight in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul said, as you remember, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whoever, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand together and sing. If you all just want to hang on to your cups, we'll sing a little bit together and then we'll pray over the elements and take them. I hear the Savior say, the strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus.
forsaken on the cross on our behalf. You can tell us that we have your righteousness because he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Jesus, that is why we're gathered here tonight. We ponder, we wonder, we contemplate your sacrifice on the cross, the cost of your bloodshed, the precious blood poured out for us. Father, we know that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, and Jesus, you paid the price, the penalty of sin is death. And by your death, you have given us life. By your wounds, we are healed. And Jesus, we look at the cross and we bow and worship you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for your humility, for your grace, for your mercy, for your incredible love displayed on the cross. Jesus, we long for Sunday. We long for your resurrection day that we will celebrate. We know what's coming. And as we leave, Jesus, I pray that you would instill in our hearts a deep desire to live like you. Thank you that you sacrificed your life to give us life and life abundantly. We worship you, King Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.